in this pie chart go counterclockwise, starting at 3 o'clock. The upper half of the chart represents investments of time, and hence money, in a simulation project. The lower half represents enticing opportunities for return on that investment. Now notice that step three is large. Earlier, we remarked that simulations done early in the life cycle of a production process have high benefit to cost ratios. Mentioned that in webinars we do on input analysis. These simulations also present the greatest challenge to data collection. And another webinar we offer frequently addresses these issues. Likewise, to verify a model means to ensure that it behaves as the modeler intends it to. And to validate the model means to then ensure that the behavior of the model matches that of the real or proposed system in all aspects pertinent to achieving the objectives specified in objective two. Now step six is the largest of all. Building, verifying, and validating an excellent model and then not using it for extensive experimentation is like buying a luxury car and then keeping it in the garage instead of using it for reliable, enjoyable transportation. And step nine should occur at every other step throughout the project. The final step nine represents gathering and organizing all documentation produced at all previous steps. So for this webinar, we concentrate on steps six and seven. Now here's typical output. Each and every one of these items are routinely provided by good quality simulation software. All of them represent key performance metrics relative to manufacturing systems, service systems like hotels, banks, hospitals, clinics, and logistics systems, many others, thereby drawing attention to the versatility of simulation. System sensitivity is high relative to a system parameter if a small change in that parameter, for example, cycle time of a machine, changes system performance greatly. It is low if small changes in the input produce small changes in the output. So in this example, looking at manufacturing, system sensitivity would be high for a bottleneck machine. Otherwise, it would be low. Now, about running the model. These three questions are pertinent to both input analysis and output analysis. They must be answered before the model is run. A simulation model on the computer normally starts out empty and idle. If the real system does also, for example, a bank opens at 9 a.m. and closes at 4.30 p.m., the model is terminating. If the system runs without emptying out, like a factory from one day to the next, or an emergency room, the system is steady state. Now, terminating systems use zero warm-up time. Steady state systems need warm-up time until the model ramps up from empty and idle to typical conditions. The warm-up time can be shortened by introducing some entities into the system at time zero. Multiple replications, usually from 5 to 50, I guarantee more than one, depending on the level of variability in the system and the narrowness of confidence intervals desired for key performance metrics are always needed. That is to say, since a simulation run is a random experiment on a stochastic system, one replication is never enough. 
Let's look at a bit more detail. An example of a terminating system, I mentioned the bank or a restaurant that reopens empty and idle at 8 o'clock each morning. An example of steady state or non-terminating systems, hospital emergency rooms, blast furnaces, telephone exchanges. So as stated, no explicit warm-up required. For terminating systems, the correct warm-up time is zero. And for non-terminating systems, you have to run for sufficient simulated time without using the model statistics in output analysis to bring the model to typical long-run average conditions of the real system. Graphs, numerical comparison, and various statistical tests can be used to determine how long this sufficient time is, as will be sketched in the graph on this next slide. Now, you don't want to use these data. They're not typical. But the model had to run to fill up to typical conditions. Simulation software will produce graphs like this. In fact, they'll be nicer looking than the sketch on request. Just a couple of mouse clicks. And graphs like these, as just mentioned, are helpful to choose warm-up time wisely. If the warm-up time is too short, like here, you've got this non-typical data contaminating, shall we say, your results. If the warm-up time is longer than necessary, like all the way over to here, you've discarded some data you could use for results collection. And that's to the detriment of, for example, confidence intervals constructed from simulation output. Now, let's suppose the results collection period will be 10 work days of 8 hours each, and a warm-up time of 14 hours is adequate. At very little cost in computer runtime, the warm-up period should then be 16 hours, that's two days' work, to provide convenience of computation and a margin of safety. Well, now let's look at the number of replications. I already said it should never be only one. For example, a researcher wanting to assess the effect of a new fertilizer on corn plants would not grow just one fertilized plant. The researcher would grow many to isolate the effect of the fertilizer, if any, from noise, that is, randomness, caused by variation in sunshine, moisture, soil, and the seeds themselves. The multiple corn plants are, in this context, multiple replications. In a simulation study, the replications are multiple runs, each statistically independent of all others. Simulation software random number generators ensure that. More replications can produce narrower confidence intervals for a given confidence level, usually 90, 95, or 99 percent, or confidence intervals of a given width at a higher confidence level. It's important to note, as a consequence of fundamental statistical theory, that having the width of a confidence interval with other conditions equal, requires four times, not twice, as many replications. There's a square root factor involved in the basic statistical formulas. Now, how do you reduce the variance of the outputs? Well, you use variance reduction techniques. That's exactly what they're called. The first two of these techniques are commonly used and very useful. The CRN technique is used when you're comparing two or more alternatives. It has the intuitive appeal of ensuring that all competing alternatives are examined under the same luck of the draw of random numbers. 
On the other hand, when you're making multiple runs of a single system to obtain narrow confidence intervals for its performance metrics, the AV technique ensures that if one run is made, by random chance with lucky draws from the random numbers used by the model, for example, the random numbers produced relatively little downtime, its counterpart run will be made with correspondingly unlucky draws. Hence, when using this method, the number of replications is always an even number. Simulation software typically provides one-click accessibility to either of these two methods. The remaining two techniques have rarer and more specialized uses. Now, what design of experiment shall we use? When you're comparing more than two alternatives, and many studies we see in practice compare a dozen or more, DOE techniques are far more efficient both statistically and in the sense of making economical use of the analyst's time than many pairwise comparisons of two alternatives at a time. The best choice of design requires a shop talk between the client, that's the person who will use the simulation results, and a knowledgeable statistician. These are some of the most common of the many choices available. Simulation software readily supports exportation of output results to a statistical software package for defining the DOE to use and obtaining reliable conclusions concerning the alternatives model. And in that sense, we need to consider what type of answer or inference is needed? These four bullet points are examples of inferences that may be needed from a simulation study. These choices are best made in advance during the design of the model and analysis of its input data. Quantitative results require more accuracy of data and more replications than qualitative or comparative results. The client may wish, for example, a real example, to compare eight systems and know which the best two are, either unranked or in first and second order. Or for narrowing choice, the client may first wish to be told, for example, that a subset of three of the eight systems will contain the best of the eight within a specified confidence level. Mm -hmm.